Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today we are doing part two on our character study, and the character is Abraham. If you didn't see part one, it's uh, already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Feel free to go back and watch that. Uh, with me today I have uh, two saints, uh, the Panda Man Evangelist and Thick Shades, Brother Bill and Brother Sam. Brother Sam, why don't you say hi to everybody first before we get going. Hello, everybody. This is Thick Shades, or uh, Uncle Sam. Uh, God bless you. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome I think to this episode. Just... <laughs> Brother, Luke. Brother Luke. Hold on, hold on. What happened there? That's all I think was bad feedback. I bad feedback, man. Background. It was so unprofessional of me. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought you loved the sound of my voice and wanted to play that back again. <laughs> now, now we know that uh, it's live and it's working. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Um, hi. God bless you, and hope that uh, we're gonna have a fulfilling and edifying study today. Yes. Okay. Uh, that this is Brother Sam. And his channel is Thick Shades, and Uncle Sam. I hope you subscribe to his channels. And we also have Brother Bill. Go ahead, Brother Bill. Hello, oh, yeah, it's uh, Bill here, and I am uh, the kind of man evangelist. And as you can tell by my, you know, my username, you know, I evangelize, you know, well, any way I can, whether it's on the streets, whether it's on Facebook or on YouTube, you know, I try and evangelize. So welcome. Brother Bill, I, you, you don't have your video camera on. Is is your eye still swollen up? No, it's a, it's a little bit bad. I might I might turn the camera on a little bit later. The oh, okay. daughter was playing about with it, and it's slightly squiff at the moment. So I'm going to have to adjust it as we go, you know continue the study. Okay, all right. There's well. a rumor floating around, um, Brother Bill, that you got either punched by your wife or by me. So I mean, which one is correct? <laughs> well, well, unfortunately, they both sound like good stories, but neither are correct. It's just a stupid flipping eye infection. But it looked like I had a, you know, a damn good punch in it. I thought you got punched by, uh, by her on, on her birthday. <laughs> yeah, well, it was, believe it or not, it did come up, believe it, the, the, the day of the birthday. It was that evening. I started you know, tingling and itching. And, and then the next morning, boof, it looked like I'd been kicked in the face by a horse. I, I kind of figured that that happened. You know, when you do something unusual, you gotta you gotta love your wife all the time, bro. <laughs> when you do something unusual out of your norm, you're gonna get tired and you get one of those in your eyes. <laughs> well, I'm glad that uh, your eye problem is improving. Uh, okay, uh, in part one, I, I I was able to get through all the verses that have the name Abram. Uh, and, and we just reached the point where Abram's name was changed, so we'll be discussing the other verses that have the name Abraham. But let's go back to that one verse. I'd like to get your feedback on that. I'm using Bible Gateway now because the uh, Bible Hub uh, was not giving me what I wanted here. But Bible Gateway, I'm looking at uh, all the occurrences of the word Abraham, and we're going to Genesis 17:5 first, and it says. Uh, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Uh, all right. Uh, you can put that in context however you like. Uh, um, who would like to talk uh, first about that verse? So, I don't need just like to say that God... He you know, does tend to do that oftentimes when, you know, when when he makes a, a covenant or, or a promise or something with, you know, with with, with people, with men, because obviously he, he made a, the promise and covenant with, you know, Abram, and his name changed to Abraham, and we have the same thing, you know, where where the angel of the Lord, you know, some say it was God, some say it weren't, you know, had, had a wrestling match, you know, with Jacob, and he, and his his name got changed to. To Israel afterwards. So it seems to be like a new covenant, you get a new name. 
Yeah, you're right. It's it's happened quite often. But uh, what I've always found interesting, and I'm not sure how to take this. Uh, it's what's the cause and the effect here with a name? It seems like everybody's name in the scripture has a meaning, and I found that the meaning of their name uh, often describes the person quite well. And I'm wondering uh, if they were given that name at birth and then their life played out and their life turned out to be actually the way the name described them to be. Uh, have you ever thought about that? How, wh why is that the case all the time? Same. Brother Sam? Mm, I think maybe because you are born again, bottom line. I think you're basically, uh, you know, you're given with a name when you're born into this world, in this physical world, and when you're born spiritually, um, um, you know, you're also given with a name, I think. And in this case, uh, from Abraham to Abraham, um, meaning it, it does define what Abraham means, for a, a father of many nations, right? And, um, you know, that's probably when um, Abram uh, was kind of truly born again, and, and then um, his name was changed to Abraham. Um, so, I don't know, even for me sometimes, uh, when I was born again, uh, I was given me the name too. <laughs> but uh, basically... Uh, um, you know, means a way of sur a surrender, the way of surrender, you know, surrendering to Christ, uh, you know, asking Christ uh, to handle, to take the handle of my life, and so on. So I think that's what happened when he was 99. That's very, very interesting. Uh, um, yeah, the, uh, the name change, God changed his name, uh, and I guess when you say Talk about your new name. Was it Sam or short for Samuel? My legal name. And the legal name is kind of um, hard for people to pronounce. And also, when you do pronounce it, it does sound like some cussing word, you know? So, uh, but uh, my dad has given me the name Sam, right? When I was, uh, when I was going to school first uh, in the States. In high school, so people, you know, would call me by that name. Uh, but it wasn't the name that was given when I was born. But when I was born again, um, I was given with a name, um, and basically that name means uh, a way of surrender, uh, a way of surrendering. So, so you know, but to namely is called I. Yeah, I was at the state that, you know what, I don't know, I don't know what's going on. I tried to do everything in my power uh, to do it my way, and nothing's working in my way. So I hand it all to you. You take my hand, you take the handle of my life. And, and uh, you know, basically, based, when, I, when I was in that kind of status, um, I, was, I was born again, so to say. And uh, uh, finally come to realize that, oh, yeah, that name that was given, I guess that's what it means, <laughs> you know, so. All right, thank you, brother. Uh, brother Bill, uh, what do you have to say about this idea of people having names in the Bible? And it can't just be a coincidence that the name is normally very descriptive of that person's life and character. Yeah, that is, that is an unusual phenomenon. Yeah, because, look, Jacob is, well, in the English it's James, and it means usurper. And that's exactly what he did. He, he usurped, you know, Esau's birthright, you know, through obviously the pottage. So he did literally fulfill his namesake. So it is interesting phenomenon. Uh, it, it makes me wonder, too, as a parent, why would I name my child at, at birth? I choose a name like usurper. Why would I want to give him a name saying he's going to be describing him as a usurper? That's like giving someone a name. As soon as they're born, you say, his name is liar. His name is thief. 
<laughs> Why did they let the parent do that? <laughs> yeah, that'd be funny. But yeah, it's weird, isn't it? It's weird. And obviously, you know, he did seem to fulfil that task well. But I think after his little wrestling match, you know, God give him a new name because he, he, you know, he's no longer a new surfer. So. All right. Well, let me ask you, Brother Bill, I got you there, about that particular verse. Uh, when it says that uh, 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 neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Now, I know that uh, Abraham, uh, he's the father of, Abra of Jacob, uh, Isaac and Jacob and the 12 tribes and the nation of Israel, but how is he the father of many nations? Well, the beauty is, if you, if you, if you, if you want to study the Bible, you know, it's well worth doing. If you trace from Abraham through Isaac and all the tribes, thanks be to God that it ends at Christ Jesus, who's God himself, and it's from him, the seed, singular, because we find that in Romans, is the singular seed of Abraham, that through him all nations can be blessed and can be saved. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. The uh, He's the father of many nations uh, because um, people from all nations um, have this uh, ability to be saved because of his seed, which, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, so people from all nations, and Paul talks about that, uh, this very point in, in the book of Romans, but we'll be coming to that eventually. Um, all right, let's go to the next verse. Uh, this is Genesis 17, 9. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. Let me look at that in the context, uh, 17.9. Uh, and I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee, every man child among you shall be circumcised. So there's the context of this uh, verse with the name Abraham in it. Uh, okay, uh, Sam, do you have anything to say about that? Uh, have you covered uh, what Abra uh, Abraham mean? Uh, not Abraham, but Abraham. Uh, no, I don't think I actually covered the, the, the meaning of the name. Um, I think it, um, I think it means some, some, some kind of father. I think it means some kind of father. Um, let me just Google it real quick. Um, it means, um, uh, exalted father, it says. So, Abba, when we say Abba or, uh, Ab, relate to to father so but thing is what kind of father are we talking about from Abraham that's like if it means truly exalted father it's just father of just his own family that would be just about it but exalted uh, you know still good but once you know God has given him a new name Abraham he is now um, um, father so-called the father of faith uh, or the uh, you know the father of many nations. I mean, if you look at the Middle East for now, there's many people, and uh, even just uh, physically talking, uh, not just you know spiritual manner, but also you know physically, there are many nations in the Middle East, and uh, you know as we know, there are whether Jewish or Palestine, uh, that uh, they are from Abraham, um, you know. Of course, uh, spiritually, we, we, we would be talking about that Christian uh, saints uh, and that sort of uh, nation. 
uh, father of all faith. And, um, you know, when, uh, when we, it seems like he kind of advanced in a way, <laughs> in a smaller place, being a father of his own, of his own family, to the father of the old nation, uh, many nations, I mean. So I think it makes a little difference. I mean, it's a huge difference, of course. It's like being saved and, and, and then and, and versus not being saved, it seems like, almost. Uh, you can be exalted father all you want, but, you know, I mean, as if, if you don't have that covenant with, with God, then, then that's about it. But because you have that covenant with God, and and that you know, and, and because of the promise, he his seeds actually became uh, many nation, and thereby him becoming the father of many nation and many seeds. Uh, so, and 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 of course, uh, from the from that lineage, Jesus Christ came about, and of course, uh, you know. Uh, we, as uh, Christians, that we when we believe, uh, we can have actually that sort of a uh, spiritual nation also as well. Uh, so I think it's, um, it's pretty much saying um, both things here: physical and spiritual, of all of many nations. Okay. Uh Brother Bill, what what do you say about it? Well, yeah, there's obviously different, and I think the first point that Sam made is probably most accurate that he was an exalted father, you know, within his own kindred in that sense. But when he became, you know, Abraham, you know, an even more blessing was you know brought out there because he was the father of all nations, and he was gonna. Through by Isaac produced, the, you know, the Messiah, the Christ. So yeah, there's a big difference there from being exalted within your kindred to be highly exalted, in as much as that through his line and seed is going to come God Himself on earth. That, that's amazing. Yeah. And also, like later on in the chapter, we probably know that uh, we'll probably find out why actually God had chosen. Uh, Abraham, you know, I mean, uh, because of his faith, bottom line, you know, he has tremendous faith towards uh, towards God and his promise, you know, to the point that he would actually would sacrifice his son because of that promise, because of that faith. I mean, think about it. If you haven't heard anything from God, right, um, and then you, if you don't have that covenant, how could you even, you know, do that sort of thing, you know, like sacrificing your own son or trying to or whatever? So because he had actually this solid covenant with, with God, he had this deep faith uh, uh, about, about that particular covenant, that through him, you know, there will be many nations, you know. Okay, uh, I'm. Uh, I'd like your opinion on the first eight. Uh, I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Um, I talked about this last week uh, about how the people in Canaan and all those different people who populated that area that was uh, God promised Abraham, it was already populated with other people. Um, so throughout history there's been a struggle for that land about who really who has uh, the right to that land. The people who were on it before because there's a lot of people that don't believe what we're reading here. They don't believe God gave the land to Abraham, so they're, they're challenging who the rightful ownership. And then you also have the the challenge of the land because of uh, I talked about uh, Isaac and Ishmael and being half brothers and uh, how Ishmael's descendants became 
the, uh, the Arab people and the, the Muslim people. And since he was the firstborn, even though he was not uh, the legitimate son uh, through Sarah, but he, uh, he still was the firstborn. So uh, the, um, the Arab and the Muslim people, they dismiss Isaac's rights and think the rights to the land go through Ishmael. So for all those reasons, you've seen this hostility and battle for, for that, uh, that land. And uh, can I get your opinion on all that, uh, Brother Bill? Oh, wow. You've really hit opened a, 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 a hornet's nest there, haven't you? I, I, I suppose I'm going to be controversial, and, you know, but that's just what I believe at the moment, looking through scriptures. and I've looked at all sorts of different angles of these verses, and, and the way I see it now is that this promise is to the seed who is Christ Jesus and those who believe on this Christ Jesus being that seed who are Christians so the everlasting, everlasting possession of this land or promise of this land goes to me who I believe to all those who believe on Christ are the legitimate heirs if that makes sense to the land and not only that land but you know, to all the nations on the earth. You know, we, we, we've took up Christ Gauntlet being the seed, and his seed is implanted into us. So really, you know, it, it, I suppose in that sense, the Christian is the one who possesses and is who is blessed. I know it's controversial, but, you know, that's the way I see it. You know, for years I used to see it as the, the literal uh, descendants, you know, the Israelites, but nobody really knows... To be honest, who they are, because they were scattered abroad. Even, even James makes that point in his early epistles, right. and, and lots of working out who this seed is. Could, it I isn't, could, you know, seed as in many. You know, it's not seeds plural. It's seed singular, Christ, and those who believe on Christ are, you know, with Him, or in Him, and in and us. If that makes sense. Yeah, I, I just shared a video, uh, a movie. Uh, produced by Steven Anderson just a few days ago about this very topic and uh, uh, I'm in agreement with you. Um, you know, some people would say that what we believe they would call it as replacement theology. I don't think it's replacement as much as uh, no, Jews can be included too. Uh, we're not replacing Jews. It's just that Gentiles and Jews, anybody in the whole world can take, partake of this promise the, the promises of the inheritance of the earth, the promises of salvation and eternal life through Abraham's seed, Jesus. So uh, it's really more of a, an inclusion rather than a play, or replacement theology. And But I do think that uh, as Paul talks about, again in Romans, I think it's Romans uh, uh, 8, uh, it, but he, I he talks about how uh, your true Israel, the true Jew, is one who believes in Jesus. It's a, it's, it's a spiritual thing. It's not a, a genealogical, uh, you know, genetic classification of being a Jew that matters. Uh, but they, but that's how we see it. But that doesn't prevent all the tr these various tribes over there still fighting over that land, and and a lot of people don't understand why. All different people feel they have the right to the land, and and it, it can be traced back to this promise that God made, and there were people who lived on the land already, so they they no longer have it because we believe God promised that land to us. Uh, uh, the uh, so, but they they would challenge that because they don't believe the way we believe, and then you you've got all of the descendants of Ishmael that turns out to be the, all the Muslim people. Uh, they 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 think that they have the right to it rather than Isaac Isaac's descendants. So these are the reasons it can be traced back to these half brothers uh, who who are, uh, who has the legal right to that that land. But as you said, the real legal right to the land are all those people who put their faith in Jesus because we are what Paul calls the true Israel, true Jews. Uh, Brother Sam, what's your take on all this? I uh, agree with you, and also I'd like to add a few more things. 
the uh, the guys in the Middle East uh, they are indeed seeds of Abraham uh, because God did uh, God did bless them. God did bless um, Ishmael, and He said um, in verse twenty, "It says so." And 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 he said, "God, God will make him fruitful and multiply him, and uh, and make him a great nation, and so forth." But the thing is, the important thing is, it seems like these guys, uh, uh, Muslim bros uh, in the Middle East, they seem to kind of conveniently forgot the verse twenty-one, where it says, "My covenant will I establish with Isaac." You know, that's the covenant. The the, the most important thing anywhere in this chapter regarding Abraham is the covenant. What is the covenant? The promise is that through Isaac, right, because he said my covenant will be will I establish with Isaac, so through that lineage, not Ishmael, through that lineage, that covenant, the promise will come true, which is what? Jesus Christ. And that is whosoever believe on him that you will have everlasting life. That is a promise. And he was he's actually promising the work of God with Abraham right now here. So I'm sorry, uh, guys in Muslim, uh, Muslim guys in the Middle East. Yes, God did promise and God did bless you to be a great nation. But thing is, the covenant is with, guess who? Isaac. And through him, Jesus Christ. And through Jesus Christ, we will be saved. Simple as that. All right, let's move on to this other verse, uh, the uh, verse 10. Um, this is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Well, I know that the custom was to circumcise the, the child on the eighth day of life. I always thought that was fascinating because I learned that uh, the, uh, the the eighth day is the perfect day because of the ability for um, a baby to their blood to clot. And if you did it too soon, uh, their blood would not clot and, and uh, it would not uh, be as easy for them to you get through it, and any longer than that is, I, I don't remember the scientific explanation, but I remember years ago I learned that it's, it's exactly the eighth also day. The immune What's that? It, also the immune system, that, uh, that is the time when the uh, uh, infection can occur the least. Mm -hmm. So whenever you have surgery or kind of, you know, you get the, the main cause of any kind of complication is infection. So in the eighth day, uh, that's when the babies are strongest uh, and, and, and uh, repel all these uh, infections and so forth. They're quite immune. Yes. Well, I, I, there's a lot of things I've learned that I can't repeat because I, I haven't uh, uh, a bill post here. Romans 2.29, he is a Jew which is born inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of man but of God. Yeah, so we know that true circumcision that really matters uh, today is the spiritual circumcision, uh, uh, which happens when we believe in Jesus. But I'm, I'm asking about the physical circumcision, and uh, I wonder in history, has any other tribes of people in history practiced this, or is this the beginning of circumcision? Because a lot of people today, they believe that circumcision is a healthy thing to do uh, and, and because um, a man is less likely to get infections and it's easier to keep, stay clean. Or, or there, There's reasons they argue for circumcision and then there's also a faction of people that say that it's best not to circumcise um, for uh, health reasons. Uh, but I don't know anything about the history of circumcision. Was this the very beginning? And it didn't it, and if it was, I mean if man was doing it before, how could he possibly dream up such a thing? Why would he even think of doing such a thing? 
And then when God told Abraham to do it, if it wasn't practiced beforehand, uh, if man wasn't familiar with this before, I mean, that's a pretty strange thing to come up with is to cut off the foreskin. I mean, that's, that seems very, very bizarre to me, but that's what God told Abraham. So, <laughs> Brother Bill? Um, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, well, like I, said, I, don't know, I don't know the reason even God, God in his vast knowledge and superior knowledge, I'm sure is going to tell us when we get up to glory, because to me it's a mystery as well, you know. I, I, I would have been happy just from a, a pin prick in the finger or something, but, you know, God God knows best and he knew what he was doing. There's a reason, so it might even be, you know, hygiene reasons as well, you know, in, in you know, the sort of area they were in the Middle East and hot and humid. You know, if a young a male had the foreskin left on, it is more prone to infections and the like. So perhaps God was using a kind of twofold, you know, logic there. One, okay, we use it as a covenant, but two, it's also going to keep it clean, hygienic, and, and less chance of getting infection. So it could be an element there as well. And I think that's the um, uh, hmm, there are two. Uh, there are two things going on here in verse 11, I think. One is that, you know, you, you don't spread your seed with your finger, <laughs> okay? Right? You spread your seed with your organ, right? Uh, the, in the crotch area. Now, so that kind of symbolizes that, okay, that's where the seed is going to come from. And secondly, I think... Uh, no, because you know that's where the seed is coming from. And secondly, in verse eleven, uh, it says, "It shall be a token of the covenant between uh, the betwixt, meaning between me and you." It's a token. So, like, let's say you are, you know, you have a promise or you promise something, and as time goes by, you tend to forget, you know. And as generation after generation, this sort of covenant, very important covenant, can be forgotten. So by practicing this sort of uh, token, they can remember the covenant constantly. I think there are two purposes in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a very good point, Brother Sam. Uh, you certainly, it's something you can never forget. I mean, every time a man looks at his his uh, penis and sees it, sees it, it's a reminder of this this uh, promise. So, uh, but yeah, it's hard for me to think that this is a beneficial uh, uh, in terms of health. Uh, we talk about the the infections and cleanliness and stuff, but on the other hand. It, it makes me wonder if God created man with the foreskin, <laughs> did God make a mistake? Because man could improve it by removing the foreskin. If it's an improvement, then God must have made an inferior product and man has to improve it himself by this surgery. Uh, and, uh, so that's the whole problem with that. I don't think it's a matter of uh, improving something, but as the verse said, that you remind yourself with. And, and also, I remember reading in some article that it is healthier to remove your foreskin because uh, as you grow and you, you pee and stuff, and you know, a lot of uh, little things can gather up inside the foreskin. And you know that can lead you to more, uh, you know, stinky and <laughs> more, you know, disgusting stuff. So you know, by removing the foreskin, it, you can clean, uh, you can keep that place clean as well. And, I mean, I remember reading that. I don't, I don't know. I, I may be wrong, but uh, I remember reading that uh, if you have foreskin for certain people, it can lead you to more uh, complication. Uh, but whether it's beneficial or not beneficial, uh, I think uh, when it's done correctly, I don't think it will be harming anyone. Uh, it will be painful for a while, 
but um, you know, as long as you take care of it and keep, you know, keep yourself away from the infection and so forth, then you know, after that, it's, uh, it's nothing. Um, so, you know, again, it's not. About, I don't think it's about uh, whether it's beneficial, beneficial, or whether God made a mistake. Uh, I, but rather, you can have it without or uh, with. Uh, it's just a skin. So, um, so rather than actually the benefit of it, I think it's just a mere, uh, actually, you know, a token, a sign that we always remember the covenant, you know, that God made with Abraham. And I don't know. I mean, whenever you see your foreskin, I, I don't know if that means if if that means to remember Jesus Christ. Hey, you know, <laughs> it's. It's, it's up to you, but you did raise a good point that, that now I gotta remember Jesus Christ whenever I gotta, I gotta go pee or something, <laughs> you know, Brother Luke. <laughs> Let me ask uh, Brother Bill to, uh, do you know anything about the history of circumcision? Uh, if, if circumcision was practiced before Abraham at all, and on the other, and the other question I had was, uh, does does this reflect in any way badly on God as a creator? Uh, if if it is an improvement to circumcise, does it reflect badly that God just gave us too much skin and we're better off where it's healthier to remove it? Brother Bill? Well, I think because you've got to also take into account that, you know, before the fall, you know, the, the, the world wasn't full of, you know, infectious diseases and all these sort of problems. It was probably... The world temperature was at a perfect climate, so we wouldn't have had issues. So it wouldn't have been God making a mistake, making them with a foreskin, but because of the fall and the climate change and all these other infectious diseases, you know, you can see there is a logic there to, to remove it. And, and, and as Sam said, there is a science behind it. You know, when people dribble or piddle, and you, you get fungal infections, you get you know, all sorts of infections if, if, you, if you're not keeping things up to up to spec in regard to that area. But as for circumcision, I think it literally is semantic. It is actually, you know, from that time. I can't, I'm having a, I even have to go on Wikipedia to look around. And, you know, it seems that any, any, any nations or tribes or peoples who were circumcised were after, you know, the times of Abraham. So they may have been Jews at some point and then kept up that custom. But, you know, pre, pre-Abraham, pre you know, circumcision wasn't done. Okay. Uh, I guess uh, that's enough talk about circumcision. Let's uh, look at the next verse. Uh, and before we move on, um, I did uh, Google interesting thing. If you Google, Google uns uncircumcised cause yeast infections. If you look into that, uh, you know, I mean, when, when that forehead, foreskin is folded, tucked under, uh, you know, a lot of things going on there. And when you're not cleaning that and have, uh, you know, intercourse, so to say, um, there is a higher chance to give uh, your wife or uh, your partner uh, some yeast infections. So, so I think that... <laughs> There is a certain um, uh, medical reason as well, you know. Okay, uh, I do think, uh, Brother Bill, your point about the the fall, um, uh, you know, this wouldn't even be an issue if it, if there was no fall because we wouldn't have had any disease at all, so it wouldn't have even been a pro an issue. So that's really the most important thing to consider in terms of answering the question: Is was God, you know, did He make a mistake giving us this? foreskin and uh, and man has to improve on God's work by removing the foreskin well if it before the fall it wouldn't have, wasn't a problem so okay let um, let's go on to the next uh, verse this is uh, Genesis 17 9 no I don't know, I'm sorry 17 15 and God said unto Abraham as for Sarai thy wife thou shall not call her name Sarai but Sarah shall be her name. And so in context, uh, 
And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. What, what is interesting, just because I knew you'd probably ask the question about, you know, what does Sarai mean, you know, before it's changed to Sarah, and it's quite funny, because it means argumentative. So, so she was an argumentative woman, obviously. That's interesting. Maybe I lost the connection. I I just put um, you know this so-called um, meaning of the names uh, Sarai and Sarah. Uh, Sarah is uh, means my lady, my princess. Sarah is princess, uh, means princess. So it, I guess it's another uh, advancement uh, as well. Sarai, from just mere my lady, <laughs> she is advanced to princess. You know, from my mere my lady, from mere my princess, she is advanced to princess. Princess meaning she could be our princess or uh, others' princess as well. So another level up there. Yeah. Well, somewhere Bill found her uh, her name to mean uh, argumentative, and. Uh Well, I think Brother Luke has a network issue. Can you hear him? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? You just broke up for me. I yeah, know. I saw I lost. Uh, somehow I, there's two of me now. I don't know what to do about that. I'll just leave them. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Brother Bill said that uh, I mean, Sarai means argumentative. And certainly, again, that's... We know that as things play out, as we go through these verses, you find out that was was a problem. Uh, but so he changed her name, just as he changed uh, Abram's name to Abraham. He changed Sarai's name to Sarah. Uh, and there's many people in scriptures where the names were changed. It seemed like everybody's name means something. It seemed like the name normally is a description of the person too. So that's all very fascinating to me. Uh, let's uh, let's go on unless you want to say something about that verse any further. She has her name changed. Uh, Although it's argument, argumentative, uh, in certain, but it, it, it's it's uh, interesting to see. Sarai originally means quarrelsome, you know, contentious, quarrelsome. You know how when she was nagging Abraham, you know, for for baby, and to the point that you know, she, you know, she would would keep her Egyptian um, slave to uh, to Abraham and stuff, you know, and 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 even till like she was nineties, you know, she's kind of kind of kind of laughing at you know what what the angel had to say, the messenger of God, you know, so I think she was. I don't know. Maybe she, she, I mean, I bet she was very, very beautiful, but uh, I think she was quite a. Uh, how should I put this? Uh, 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 spicy, <laughs> you know. I mean, during the time, women I'm sure didn't have much uh, saying, but she she had a lot to say about you know a lot of affairs that doesn't really you know concern her that. Meaning that she is involved, but you know her words will not take care of any any anything. Um, it would have been better for her to keep her mouth uh, closed and then just kind of you know follow the direction and stuff. But we we notice all throughout the passage she's always there. She's always nagging on Abraham, you know. <laughs> so it's 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 uh, it's. Uh, it's uh, argumentative, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> interesting. Well, uh, you know, Sarai, you know, if she's argumentative or contentious, uh, and then we—I don't think this is unique. I mean, I, uh, it seems like we can trace back uh, many of the women, even though the scriptures say that 
uh, uh, the man of a, the role of a man and a woman are different, and and the authority in the household is different, and but, but and yet it seemed like the women didn't really abide by it. You know, as you said, Sarah didn't keep her mouth shut. She was very assertive. Uh, that's a nice way of saying it. And, uh, uh, and and then we go back to even Eve. Look at her. She she didn't just you know go with what God said and what Adam wanted. You know, she took the initiative herself to uh, start the beginning of the fall. So uh, it's not unusual to find women that are, are not doing. What uh, a lot of people think of as, as uh, uh, what the Bible says about men and women, and yet they they normally don't do it. Uh, Brother Bill. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I disagree with that. Yeah, I disagree with everything you said. Yeah. Okay, let's let's go on to uh, a seventeen seven. Uh, I'm going to look at it in context. 1717, I mean. It says, uh, uh, Then Abraham, uh, and, he's, and God says, to, I will bless her and give, her, give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Wow. So uh, here's a man of faith, the great heroes of faith, the father of faith. Uh, but it doesn't sound like he has a lot of faith right there, does it? Well, he, he, the thing is, he does. He, he's not doubting the covenant is, itself. What he's saying is that uh, this is so naturally impossible. You know, it's breaking all the norm. So there got to be some sort of joke. You know, so he, he probably, probably God meant Ishmael, not a new son that to come. You know, and that's probably what he's thinking. So that's in eighteen. That's what Abraham is saying. Unto God, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. You know, he's thinking that, oh, okay, I, I guess that's what God meant about the co covenant. But we notice that Abraham still um, firmly believe in that covenant. Only thing is that he's kind of, kind of confused that, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, to whom that God's covenant will be laid. Brother Bill, how do you see the, that verse? Uh, 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 it seems to me that he's doubting God, laughing at the idea that at 99 and, and Sarah being 90 is going to have a child. And uh, even even back when she was like 12 years before, 11 years before, when she, she had already been promised this and that she had given up and told Abraham to take on Hagar and have a child with her, uh, uh, even at that time, she and Abraham both obviously doubted God keeping this promise, otherwise they would have gone ahead with using Hagar as a surrogate. Uh, so, uh, and, and we know that, I, I, I don't think that uh, people, uh, uh, could a woman could have a child at that age because they go through this change of life and they're no longer to have children so she was considered to be barren and uh, uh, unable to have children and, and so brother bill uh, how do you take this this part where he's laughing at, at when god tells him that we are I'm, I'm inclined to to say you know his faith was was wavering there uh, even to the point because the verse after that you know, he even not pleased with God. You know, he says, "Oh, that the Ishmael might live." I think he says, basically that that oh, Ishmael might as well be that. You know, that the, the heir, the promise, and that lot. You know, he was that convinced uh, that I suppose that that God used Hagar through permission of obviously Sarah that his seed would come. 
you know, he didn't see the actual miraculous that was going to actually appear. So he, he had faith in as much as God kept his promise in a way, but he didn't have the faith to see it manifested fully and miraculously that, that, that his wife in her old age would literally bear a literal physical son. You know, I think also the answer um, to that, whether Abraham was doubting, I think uh, Abraham was just kind of dumbfounded and just questioning. I mean, imagine, you, you hear God, God is saying, you know, you're going to have a baby, you're 100 years old. And the first thought, I think, I think it's quite natural thought to have, oh, since I have a, a son named Ishmael, probably God is talking about him. And I think that's what verse 18 is talking about. And to clarify, in verse 18, verse 19, God is actually elaborating. Is that he's basically saying, no, 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 not Ishmael. Through Sarah, you will be given a son, and you, will, you shall name him Isaac. And, and, and he will establish the covenant with him. So uh, God understood uh, where Abraham was uh, coming from uh, and why he was questioning. And that's one of the reasons why in verse 19 he further elaborates that it's not Ishmael that, um, that he's going to establish his covenant, but rather Isaac. And he even gives a specific name called Isaac. And uh, we know what it, what, what it means too, because he got, these guys were laughing. And, you know, uh, because, because they're men, you know, they're human. And what they haven't realized is that uh, what's impossible with men it's quite possible with God. So, again, here in verse 19, I think God is clearly uh, establishing the fact that uh, it will be through Isaac, not Ishmael. Sorry, Muslim guys in the Middle East, but hey, that's what the scripture says. And you believe, and you, and I'm sure they read the Bible, they believe the Bible, and if you're going to believe the Bible, you got to be, believe the whole thing. If, if you believe there was some sort of covenant, then you got to believe whom that covenant was established with. So, not Ishmael. Sorry, it was uh, Isaac. Well, let me ask, uh, Brother Bill, uh, the, uh, uh, it seems to me that uh, Sarah didn't have faith that God was going to give her a child. That's why she decided to use Hagar and Abraham agreed to it so it seems to me that that Abraham also didn't have faith that God was going to, to do this that, and uh, and now here again God promises him again at an older age and he laughs it seems to me that uh, another example of him not believing what God said and yet we consider him one of the great heroes of faith. And there's many other examples uh, of uh, Peter losing his faith when he was walking on the water and just began to sink. Um, Eve no, no longer believing God when, when uh, the devil told him, oh no, it's not so, that you won't surely die, but you'll have the knowledge of good and evil. And over and over again, we see people losing faith and not believing God when God told them. And even now, uh, I know there are times in my life, I, I think it's probably true for everybody, where our faith is stronger and weaker. And we, you know, maybe it's uh, the devil or maybe it's life circumstances, but our faith is always challenged and tested. And uh, so I, I think it should be encouraging to everybody that um, Abraham is considered this great man of faith, and yet you can see he had these shortcomings with faith too. Um, do you think that's correct, Brother Bill? Well, yeah, yeah, because it is spot on. Because, you know, if you read further on throughout, obviously, what was going on, you know, with the story between God and Abraham and, and Sarah, you know, there's quite a few times, you know, that he wavers, you know, the times he said, oh, this is my sister, you know, so we didn't, you know, it, through fear, you know, so. This is what's important to distinguish faith from faith, because there's faith in as much as you know somebody's earnestly believing 
a particular promise from God and I hold steadfast, especially in, in regards to attorney, but there's also a weaker type of faith, you know, where, where God might promise certain things, they don't seem to happen, and you falter and you lose that. So, you know, in that in that regard, you know, yeah, Abraham was the father of the faith because he believed God, you know, I that God was his salvation and everything else. But he obviously wasn't faithful in regard to believing God's promises in regard to to, uh, to, to Isaac, you know, his protection, because twice, you know, with the Egyptians, you know, he, he said, oh, this is my sister, you know, so fearful of him being killed, he's kind of give up his wife to, you know, to, to the Egyptians, twice he done it. So, yeah, there is different, you know, but it is encouraging. I think the point you are getting to is that, you know, even when we kind of become faithless and, and we draw back, uh, 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 for whatever reason, God still remains faithful to his promises in spite and despite us and our circumstances. Yeah, and there is a verse that specifically says that. I like I, to. Uh, the verse that says that even when we have no faith, he remains faithful. And to me, that's a great encouragement. That's for uh, one of the best eternal security verses that. Well, okay, you can't lose your salvation. Someone says, well, you can't lose your salvation by going into sin. You can't lose your salvation by going into apostasy. or You can't lose your salvation because, uh, uh, because uh, you know, God's going to just take it away from you. But you can lose it if you lose your faith because you've got to have faith to be saved. If you no longer have faith, see, people will say, no, you've got to maintain your faith. But the scripture specifically says, even if we have no faith, he remains faithful. So to me, that's a very comforting verse, and that tells me that even those people who, through some terrible thing, thing that's happened in their life, I know people who have lost their faith because of some tragedy. They've lost a loved one. They can become angry with God. They doubt God. They no longer believe anymore. And yet, even though they have no faith, we know that he remains faithful. Uh, he he will never leave us or forsake us. He will never release us from his grip. Um, I I like to um, kind of um, regarding uh, I I you know I, I don't think uh, Abraham was um, doubting so to say. Uh, doubt is a feeling of uncertainty. Or lack of conviction, but rather I, I would think that he was questioning. A question is a sentence worded or expressed so as to elicit, and of course, elicit means that uh, to uh, evoke or draw out a certain answer. So he is actually, I think, he is trying to you know clarify certain things by questioning, and I don't think he was actually doubting God. Especially his, uh, especially the covenant. Uh, that's why Abraham, having deep faith in the covenant, was saying, "Oh, naturally he was saying, oh, Ishmael. That's you know, that's that's him probably he's talking about." So, you know, and then God clarified that, of course, later on. But I don't think Abraham ever doubted uh, the covenant itself. He may have questioned. Uh, how God could, you know, do such a thing, but I don't think he was in any doubt at all. All right, you you have more confidence in Abraham than I do, I guess. Now let's go on to another verse here. Uh, let me see. Next one is um, seventeen seventy. Um, 1722. I, I think we are we're going to be on 19, is it? Uh, now the next one that appears is uh, is verse 22. Um, and he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. Uh, and 23. And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day, as God had said unto him. 
and Abraham was 99, was 90 uh, years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Well, that's interesting. I, I don't think I ever uh, saw the chronology of this the way I just see it right now. Uh, that that's when he, uh, this covenant was made at 99 and the, the circumcision went into effect. Uh, even though God had made the promise long before that, uh, even before Ishmael, uh, what was uh, be, long before because obviously uh, if God had promised Abram, Abraham uh, that he and Sarah would have a, a, a son and through them all these descendants then uh, for them to, to lose patience with God and to resort to their own methods and, and resort to Hagar a lot of time must have passed so I think the God's original promise was many, many years before, and now He's making it, reasserting this promise and saying that and initiating this circumcision. Brother Bill, is that? Uh, is, am I right at that? Or I, I've never really looked at the chronology of how all, all these things uh, took place. Well, yeah, it was a fair, a fair old time. Yeah, you're right, and that's the problem. If, if sometimes we miss just these little gems. You know, while reading for the scriptures, you know, we can assume that oh, Abraham was waiting about three or four years and he was getting fed. We're talking years and years yet to wait. And I've made the same point, you know, when I'm discussing, you know, the book of Acts. You know, people read through the book of Acts and think that was a matter of like two, three years. Well, that spans the history of nearly 40 years, and people forget that sometimes. You know, they think all oh, these things are happening instantaneously, day after day. And week after week, but no, sometimes that you know God is is quiet for years in that sense. You know we're, we're impatient. This place is a good lesson in patience here, really. You know that, that from the moment that, that God said something, Ishmael was born. It's 13 years before God said, right, let's initiate circumcision, and then you know all these ten, all the males in these ten got circumcised. So that's 13 years. You know we often, you know, especially in the West, you know we we, we pray for something. And we want to answer next day, but this this is where Abraham's faith does kick in. The patience in that sense that you know, yeah, he, he, I still believe he doubted and wavered, and, and his faith was wavering. But still, despite that, as soon as God comes up and renews things again, you know, he tell he's pleased with it, and, and, and straight away he gets his whole household ready to be circumcised. You know, straight away at God's command. So yeah, thirteen years in the waiting. But, you know, and sometimes we need to be that patient as well, don't we? Brother, Brother Sam, is this, uh, is this some news to you, Sam, uh, that Abraham was 99 years old when he got circumcised? Well, that shows, um, and that shows how convicted he is, first of all, and, um, and I mean, Wow, 99 years old, all right? <laughs> What's kind of interesting, kind of caught my attention is that uh, um, Ishmael, his son was 13 years old. You know, you know about number 13. So that was, I, I thought that was quite interesting. And how they all, on the same day, self same day, on the same day they all circumcised. So, I thought that was quite interesting. It's, it, it's not like, you, you know, uh, you're gonna be circumcised on 27th, or you're gonna be circumcised on 13th, or, or or whatever. It's like, hey, you're gonna be circumcised now. You're gonna do it now, <laughs> almost the same day, all at once. You know, so. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say yeah, that's a good point because most people, if they say, boy, you know, God said we've got to be circumcised, people think, oh, I'm gonna need a few days to get myself all. You know, <laughs> this is straight away. No, stop it, right. You're all getting circumcised today. That's it. That must have been amazing <laughs> and amusing at the same time. Yeah. yeah well, exactly. one, uh, we're, we're, we'll be coming to this point uh, as we go along in the study, but there comes a time where uh, uh, Jacob's, uh, uh, Israel's uh, sons get in this big 
problem. Their daughter's raped. I mean, their sister's raped, and they decide they want to get revenge, and they convince a, an, a, like a whole community of people, all the men, to be circumcised, and only because they're going to be, make peace with them and unite and join together and all become one kind of clan. Except the real reason they want to circumcise is because to disable them so they can go in and easily beat them in, in, a, in a battle and kill them. So here you have a lot of people being circumcised on the same day too, but that, in that case the circumcision, it wasn't for to prevent disease, it was to uh, you know uh, give them an advantage and make it easy to kill them. All right. Yeah, that's a, fun, that's a really funny story. <laughs> and that was that's you know yeah they really want to be uh, a part of them uh, so-called chosen ones and uh, I mean these heathens raping people it, they you know it was quite funny and and wise that uh, hey you know if you want to be one of us then you gotta circumcise otherwise you know whatever and then they all circumcise and then beat the crap out of them. That's that was, that's a funny story actually. Wise, very wise. <laughs> All right, shall we move on? What you got anything to add to that, Brother Bill? No, I, only I, although it was a lot a, a plan by a certain of the brothers to get you know to kill these people because they were certain size and weak. That I know, God, even God in His love and mercy. Even he was angry at that because even God wanted mercy after they got circumcised. And I think later on, when when Abraham, uh, not Abraham, we're talking Jacob now, and we've got Joseph and all that lot. But when it comes to, to blessing the children of Israel, you know, he, he skips the blessing over the son that instigated, you know, this killing everyone once they're circumcised. So God, even God frowned on that. Yeah, it sounded like a good plan, and <laughs> they got their revenge. But but God even then was merciful, and and kind of saw when they made a covenant, they got circumcised, and you just gone and killed them all. So one of his sons missed the blessing for that, didn't he? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I wouldn't want to give anybody the impression that God was condoning uh, this. Uh, uh, all this uh, that battle and the circumstances. It was not God's idea. It was. Uh, uh, one of the, there was the twelve sons of uh, uh, Jacob. Uh, I don't remember which sons exactly were behind it, but it was them that were that dreamed it up. It wasn't God's idea. Well, let's move on to uh, this next verse, Genesis. Oh, you know Brother Lucas, let me add on that one. Okay, go ahead. I think, you know, I think because they thought that you know by doing circumcision they could be part of uh, part of them. Now, I think, you know, it, it, it certainly wasn't God's idea, of course, but what came about, what the result of it is actually, I think it was um, in tune with, with God. Because, you know, we we're talking about these guys who just merely think that, oh, you know, if we just kind of cut off our foreskin, then, you know, we are all good. It's like, you know, God is punishing these posers, so to say, wicked posers. And, you know, these guys would just only believe in their, uh, you know, just outwardly or just to show. But even when uh, these uh, Hebrews and Israelites uh, were getting circumcised, they were remembering uh, the covenant. But without actually knowing the, the, the fact and truth be, be, uh, behind, behind the uh, circumcision, when they are trying to use that for their own advantage, you know, that's how they would get spanked, you know, I think that's how I see it. Okay, let's uh, look at Genesis 18.6. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. All right, in context, let's see what it means. Uh, I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, uh, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do, as thou hast said. And Abraham 
hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran into the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man, and he hastened to dress it. All right, I, I'm wondering if the, uh, this, if this, is, is this talking about when the, uh, they visited him, uh, the Lord visited him with the angels? Let me, I don't know the whole context. Let's look a little further. Genesis 18, chapter 18. Yes, we're carry on. <laughs> okay. All right, we better, we better read this in, uh, in more context, and so we have the whole thing. What's going on here? It said, it said the Lord appeared unto him. Um, Jesus Christ um, was there. <laughs> Christ appeared to him, and amazingly, and and preparing all these goodies for him, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the when the Lord. Uh, let me ask you something here. There are quite a few instances where the Lord appears on the earth, and this was before Jesus was born. So this is a pre-incarnation appearance. Born. Now, there's really two different categories that I've, I've heard uh, people uh, explain. One's called a theophany, the other is a Christophany. It's the same thing, it's just a question of, do you believe that Christ appeared, Jesus Christ himself appeared uh, before the incarnation? Uh, like when, when uh, G, uh, G, God walked with Adam and Eve in the, in the garden. Was that, that's a theophany or a Christophany, where either God the Father or Jesus, they were, in, they were uh, walking. In the garden, and other and another example would be the uh, Jacob wrestling with the angel of the Lord, uh, and that's another term that's interesting. A lot of these cases uh, here it says the Lord, in other cases it says the angel of the Lord, and some people think that the angel of the Lord is is like Michael or Gabriel or an angel. Of the Lord, and uh, and then other people say that no, when it says the angel of the Lord, it's actually the Lord. It's just him appearing. It's another way of saying it. Of course, uh, then some people say well, that's horrible, and that's like a Jehovah Witness thing giving Jesus the title of Michael, the archangel. By the way, I they don't, from what I understand, they don't believe that Jesus was actually an angel, a name Michael, but the name Michael means is, 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 a, is a title for Jesus and that he is the king of angels. Not, not that he is an angel, but that he is king over all the angels, just like he's king of kings. Uh, I'm not trying to defend, defend it entirely, but that's how I, that's the way I've heard it explained so that they do not they're not claiming that Jesus is a creature and, and God created him as, as Michael the Archangel. Um, but my point I'm getting at is that there are a lot of examples throughout the scriptures before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Many examples we, we can cite where the Lord appears as a man. I think Melchizedek may be one of these cases. Um, and so whether it was Jesus appearing before he was born as a what's called a Christophany, or whether it was God the Father appeared, and it's a theophany, but we do know that God has appeared and walked on the earth before Jesus was, was born. And then we sometimes we see the term, the angel of the Lord. In this verse here, it just says the Lord. I'd like to get your, your comments on, on this whole idea of Christophanies, theophanies, the angel of the Lord, and in this case, is pretty simple because it says the Lord. We don't know if this, in this case, is, we can define it as Jesus or God the Father. But go ahead, uh, Brother Bill. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, you know, it might be controversial here, but the way I've, I've read this, you know, I've, I've read of, you know, Christophanies and Theophanies. I believe this is one of those 
well, the only time of rare, it, it's a triophany where, where the whole, you know, trinity come to meet Abraham because it's funny that there's three, three people visiting. You know, there's Father, Son, Holy Spirit right there. You know, and, and he calls them, you know, basically, you know, he knew who they were. You know, you, you read the context of that. You know, calling them what, you know, we know. And I think that is, you know, the, the, the only example I can see, you know, where I believe, this is personal, you know, so there might be people who want to shoot me up there for saying this, but I'm entitled to my opinion. But I, I honestly believe that is the only occurrence of a triophany, where, where the triune God himself comes and meets the, the, the father of all nations in whom whose seed will be Christ Jesus. There's a unique time and a unique purpose. Well, that's uh, really, really interesting. My question for Brother Sam is, now that we know that Bill believes in this triophany, can we still have fellowship with him? This seems like some crazy idea, right? Or or do you think it's uh, he's really brilliant seeing the, 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 the truth of this? I'll, I'll, I'll give you more. What? I'll share you something uh, crazy. Right. <laughs> I'll share you something more crazy than that. All right. Um, this is how I take it. Uh, when the scripture says the Lord, and um, that is Jesus Christ, uh, for God is quite omnipresent, uh, meaning he's everywhere, anywhere, anytime. Uh, according to God, all this, even what we are talking about, even what is going to happen, already all happened. All right? uh, what's interesting is that uh, in... In Matthew 16, 28, Christ talks about transfiguration. Verily I say unto you, there will be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I consider that as the uh, transfiguration in the next chapter where, uh, where Christ takes Peter, James, and John. Uh, uh, to uh, to a high mountain and 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 you know, he would be transfigured before then and so forth. So, I mean, as far as uh, you know, Christ, Jesus Christ, the Lord is concerned. I I think that is uh, is <laughs> it's not even difficult for him to be there. Uh, I don't know, maybe. I, I'm, I'm even, this is crazier now, I'm even, to, you know, to say like, hey, Peter, James, John, these three guys are actually the three guys, three men standing by him in, in, in Genesis 18, verse, uh, verse 2. And he lifted his eyes and looked at the Lord, three men stood by him. So there are three other guys with him, with the Lord, right? So I, I don't know, maybe it was, it was during that, time or it was you know maybe that incident was coinciding with this or but the bottom line is uh, God is omnipresent so you know any sort of whether that's Christophany or uh, Christophany however you want to put it uh, you know he is all present always present at all time he's eternal being so I think uh, here we can pretty much say that it's we are only seeing just a part of his attribute, which is uh, uh, omnipresence. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, one of the things that I value is the, um, the, the freedom for me to say and to other people to be free to say, um, Anything that they, they, how they can see things that are maybe not orthodox or not, uh, uh, that are uncommon. And uh, I think it's interesting to get these insights. Uh, for example, I've, I've never heard what Brother Bill said about this triophany, uh, this, these three being. And that, to me, that's the first time I've heard that, and I find that as, as fascinating. And, and I was, I was tr trying to be funny which I'm not a very funny guy. Usually when I try to be funny, I, I completely fail. I just end up amusing myself. <laughs> but uh, I was just joking about, you know, should we 
not not associate with Bill because he said such a strange thing. You know, no, uh, I think that it's healthy to have the brethren be free to say these things. And sometimes we get great insights, and sometimes it's say you might come up uh, hear something and say, well. I never heard that before. I think it's strange, and uh, I don't. This is the reason I think you're wrong, or in this case, I don't see any reason why uh, he couldn't be right. But, you know, as time goes on here, we find out that two of them, the three, goes into Sodom and Gomorrah, and they're called angels. But is angel always, as we see, an angel? Uh, uh, or, because, uh, or, or is the angel of the Lord? That's something you guys didn't answer, my question about the term, the angel of the Lord. If we were to just Google or just, uh, you know, do a concordance search for the term angel of the Lord, uh, are we going to think that th these occurrences are actually angels? Uh, and, you know, the only, uh, the only actual angels are, is Michael and Gabriel that I know of in the scriptures. Yeah. Yeah, what is interesting as well is the, the term angel, as you know, it means messenger. So we have obviously did what you said. We have Michael the, the archangel, Gabriel the, the messenger of messengers, because he is the, the angel messenger. And then obviously, as you just said, because there was three initially, and then they split up, and obviously two went into, into Sodom. And, and like I said, the term angel appears, doesn't it? Messengers. So these were two messengers. You know, Christ was a messenger. John the Baptist. You know, that, that, that's what is all. Some you've got to read. Really, it's hard to distinguish, and this is why there is probably some kind of confusion between angel, literally. You know, one of God's angels in in the heaven is you know with the wings or without the wings, or angel as in messenger. And you get messenger of Lord, which is most probably Christ Jesus. So this is why there's always been, you know, issue and complication just with that word angel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally. Yeah, yeah. Angel is it literally means messenger of God. So when when it's written uh, the angel of the Lord, uh, that doesn't mean that that's God, God. <laughs> messenger of God. Uh, that's basically what it means. And when it says the Lord uh, walked about, so to say, and that's a representation of God, okay? Just like Jesus Christ, when he, uh, you know, came in, fle in the flesh, he is the very representation of God. If God were to come as a mere human being, that would be Jesus Christ. Nobody else, none other. So when... When the scripture does say that the Lord appeared unto him in the plains, it's in a physical form that Abraham can actually converse with, have meal with, that sort of representation can only interpret it as Jesus Christ. That's what I think. The other guys could be other, other apostles or other angels, uh, but you know, given what, uh, what they're going to do later on, they are, you know, Host of angels. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, three let, me, men. let me ask a follow-up question. No, I'm going only by memory. I haven't looked this up to see if what I'm saying is correct or not. But uh, we one example I cited was when Jacob wrestled. Uh, and now, uh, first the question is: Do you believe that he wrestled with God? And and. If you say yes, the other question is, does it say he wrestled with the angel of the Lord? I think it does say that, if we can, anybody wants to look that up. So uh, if we believe that Jacob wrestled with God, and that uh, the, the verse said, calls this entity, this, this person he wrestled with, as the angel of the Lord, can the, the term angel of the Lord be uh, used uh, to describe a theophany. Uh, who wants to talk about that? Do, do you do you have the verse anywhere handy, Brother Bill? Can you find yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, that's that's in Genesis, Genesis, Genesis. 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 thirty-two. Right, Genesis thirty-two, uh, verse twenty-two to uh, thirty-one. Yeah, that's what that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Does this? Am, am I correct in saying that? Uh, well, we believe that 
Abraham wrestled with God, but the actual term is the angel of the Lord. Is that correct or not? It says in 20, verse 24, and Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Right? It's and, the, term, it's the term angel of the Lord within that context. Um, I don't see that. Okay. Maybe I'm wrong then. It just says that uh, Jacob uh, was uh, the man. Yeah, I think you so are the right. that man. Previous verses. I'm, I'm going to read the whole. Whether that man. Whether that's man. Because angels can be, be you know, be physical, uh, like man as well. Mm -hmm. Bill, uh, um, did you find anything so, about that? Yeah. Bill, did you did you find anything about that in the context? Yeah, yeah, because in the in the beginning of, of of the to get some context, you know, the beginning of chapter thirty two, it says, and Jacob went on his way, way, and the angels of God met him. So we have mention of the angels of God met him, and then it goes on, and, and then when we get to verse twenty eight, for a prince has the power with God and with men, and, and has prevail. So, you know, it doesn't matter what you know what 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 what, uh, what what we come across what we come across with. If if he is of God, he is from God. If he's messenger from God, angel or man or Jesus Christ, whoever, he now <laughs> power with God, he, he struggle with he wrestle with God. That's basically what he's saying. And prevail. So, okay. What I want to know, though, is well, I don't have it in front of me. Maybe Bill has it, but uh, if we if we believe that he wrestled with God, does anywhere refer to this person as the angel of the Lord, Bill? No, I'm, I'm still reading that. I haven't seen it yet, but it, it may mention it somewhere else in the script because I'm sure in scriptures that, that this scenario is repeated. And it does mention the angel of the Lord somewhere. I'm sure. I'm just, I'm just having a look now. So, okay. all right. Well, if you find that, um, it's just uh, this term, the angel of the Lord. Um, I know that uh, I, I don't know where I came up with this idea. It's not my original idea, but I know I learned from some teacher somewhere that the term angel of the Lord is a name for. Uh, uh, Christophany or Theophany. I, oh, well, one more mean, interesting yeah. fact. Sorry, sorry, just to, well, that made the break up. Yeah, but it's interesting that you know, when, when, you know, his name was originally Jacob, which means obviously James, which is usurper. After he, he wrestled with this man, this angel Lord, whatever, whatever, you know, the, the, the name Israel means he who struggles with God, or the implication he who has a fight with God. Or wrestled with God, so you know there's a hint there that th this man or this angel of the Lord, you know, could very well be God Himself. I have just uh, put the link um, in the comments. I mean, the in the chat area uh, where the uh, the the phrase "the angel of the Lord" comes, uh, and uh, there are total 82 times mentioned the angel of the Lord. So, you know, if you can just want to take a look at it, maybe we could talk about this in the next uh, study or whatever. But it's quite a study, um, 82 results uh, using angel, the angel of the Lord. Okay, brother, yeah, I think it's probably worthy of, of a study on uh, completely on, it, on its own. Uh, so if you guys are interested, uh, we can do that uh, maybe next time, go into great depth just on that term and try to determine what this means. Is it an actual angel, angel that's a messenger? Or can, when it says angel of the Lord, is it another way of saying uh, a theophany, an appearance of God on the earth? Uh, all right, let's, let's go on unless you have something else to add to this. Okay. Uh, right now we're on uh, 18.6, uh, 18, uh, 18.11. Now Abraham and Sarah 
were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. I don't know what that means. Uh, therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord? Being here's this is another example of uh, uh, God saying, that, Okay, I'll start with verse 10. Genesis 18, 10 through 12. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. And now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Now, and therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, after I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? So here's another example of uh, God promising Sarah is going to give birth. How many times is God going to promise it? And now she's so old, she's laughing at the thought of it. <laughs> yeah. You know, especially when uh, it says after the manner of women, you know, where, where verse 11 where it says stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women, and that means uh, menstruation. Um, she she cannot have any bear, she cannot bear women, I mean, any kids, because she stopped menstruating. You know, and I guess because and she knew that any women. Um, her menstruation stops, and you, there's no chance to have have a kid, and that's that's why Sarah was laughing inside within herself, you know. <laughs> yeah, let, let, let's let's continue reading this so we get more context here. The end of the conversation here. Uh, yeah, it says, uh, uh, and the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is there is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. <laughs> so surely, surely Sarah wasn't wrong, aren't you, God? <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> it's uh, and verse fourteen is basically it's you know is saying uh, what's not possible with men is is what's what's not possible with men is quite possible with God. Yeah. <laughs> and then she denies it. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> well. Uh, I, I guess it to me it is understandable. Has she she's heard this promise now several times and she's getting older and older and older. She's well beyond childbearing years. She stopped menstruating and she doesn't she's not able to have a child unless there's a miracle, of course. But normally a woman she wouldn't be able to have a child. So she's just kind of now she's laughing at the thought. Oh yeah, I've heard this promise. Uh, several times before, and now I'm just going to laugh at it, and uh, and then <laughs> she denies that she laughed. I mean, does, if she understands that this is God, or even if it's an angel, a messenger from God, and she's denying it, that's pretty. Uh, the whole thing is 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 funny, isn't it? Well, I think it's funny anyway. It just shows that God must have a sense of humor, you know. So some people preach a God, yeah, a God so. you know, and they'll, you know, this this horrible God that some people preach would strike both, you know, in a previous verse, Abraham dead for laughing, and now Sarah dead, double dead, because not only she laughed, she lied and said she didn't laugh. Yeah. Right. Now the thing is, we got to distinguish uh, why she left. I mean, why she denied. Like for example, when um, uh, Baptist John, uh, uh, what's his father's name? When he went to his uh, the, uh, the 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 temple, the beyond the tent, and uh, he, he couldn't believe that uh, you know a son would be given to them, and he kind of like what? What did he do? He 
he just kind of dismissed it. But he dismissed it not because he was afraid. He dismissed it because, you know, hey, that's, that's not even, you know, he kind of merely denied the power of God in a way. But here, Sarah did deny and Sarah did laugh, but she denied laughing because she was afraid. You see that? That means she has the reverence. She has a fear of God. And that means she still believes, you know. But that's probably why she, she, wasn't, she, was, she didn't become uh, deaf, just like uh, John's father. What's his name? I forgot. The, the priest. He went, he went down. Yeah, Zechariah was his name. Oh, Zechariah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's him. So, so the reason why they, uh, uh, she denied uh, is different than uh, um, than than how and why Jack, uh, Zechariah denied or left. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's why context is always important, you know, because it does seem, you know, sometimes some people commit kind of the most heinous crimes, and, and God kind of just gives them a slap around the wrist, and someone else seems to do a minor crime and God kind of pours his whole wrath on them. And I think, I suppose, it is down to the heart condition of, you know, what they really did feel at the heart. And uh, There's so many different factors involved that, you know, it would be impossible to go for them, all, wouldn't it? I can tell you that she was very, um, although she may be argumentative, I, I, t I can tell you she's, she's quite innocent in her, uh, in her thinking and She's a very innocent person, even at the age of 90, you know. <laughs> You're, uh, you seem to be really big fans of Abraham and Sarah uh, in spite of their, uh, what I think is uh, losing faith. But, you know, on the other hand, uh, God probably is much more tolerant of these, uh, these problems, these issues of Sarah saying, oh, God's not going to do it. Go have, take my maidservant, Hagar. We'll have a child with her. And then Abraham goes ahead and does it. And then uh, then time goes by, and, and uh, he's promised again, and he gets the circumcision, and, 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 uh, and, and Abraham seems to be doubting, doubting God. And now Sarah's doubting God. But, but when we understand how much time passed from the first promise to this point right here, it's many, many years and, and many promises of the same thing. The promise is repeated over and over that she's going to have this child. And so maybe God's thinking, well, you know, I've taken a long time. It's, it's no wonder that, there, that she's doubting and thinking it's not really going to happen because much time has passed. I'll give her a free pass on this, you know, because... Uh, you know, I, 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 I promised it over and over again, and it's taking a long time for, for me to do it. Do you think that might factor in for God being, like, more understanding about her her attitude? It might have. Like I said, oh, yeah, there's certainly loads of factors involved. And, but I really do, and we probably all do, really, believe it is certainly an issue of the heart, is it? Because you do honestly say, you know, you read the scriptures from, from front to back, you see two similar scenarios and God deals, you know, pretty moderate to one, but really harsh to another. Like King David, you know, committing adultery and sending, you know, <laughs> poor old matey up the wall to get killed so he had Bathsheba. You know, another scenario, you know, that person would have been struck dead. But King David, you know, the apple of his eye. You know, it's so... Yeah, and I think it's down to the heart issue because, you know, David still, although he was sinful and wretched at times, a bit like me and everyone else, you know, loved God. And there was a genuine heart love connection between him and God, whereas someone else who may have done the same didn't have that connection and there was no love between that, the person and God. So heart issue, I believe, you know, is fundamental in this. Well, the, a, a person that comes to my mind is... Uh, Ananias and Sapphira, that, that uh, uh, they weren't required to give anything, uh, but they they came forth and they presented this offering to the, the this first Christian community, 
and they, they, everybody was like bringing in these these donations, and they they came in and said they sold their house and gave everything. And uh, it wasn't the issue of whether they gave it all or how much they gave. It was the issue was they said they gave everything from the sale of the house, and they in fact didn't. They gave only half of it. So they lied to God, and in that case. God wasn't so understanding. They were they were both struck dead because of that. So uh, I think that's uh, the the example, the contrast uh, in terms of uh, uh, there was something wrong with their their heart that they wanted to to get get credit for this giving when they were really just lying about it. Yeah. And you're spot on again. Like, like we just said, it is a heart issue because the, the verse. You know that, that speaks to me because that's that's obviously found in Acts chapter five, and and verse three that says, but Peter said, Ananias, why have Satan filled thine heart to light the Holy Ghost? So there is a heart issue, you know that that their heart was filled, you know whatever this satanic influence was, it was still a heart issue. Yeah. I totally agree with that, and if I were to further elaborate that, the reason why they had that heart issue is because, you know, obviously as it's written, they were tempted by Satan, and and what is you know how, what is Satan tempting them with? With things, with uh, with property, with money. So they, they what they did is they premeditated, they conspired to um, you know to lie. Against the Holy Spirit, that's um, that's that's uh, that's pretty, pretty what happened. When they conspire and premeditate that sort of mal malice and evil things against the Holy Spirit, you're gonna get spanked for sure, whether that's staff or whatever. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Uh, all right. Can we go on? Uh, let's look at the next verse here. Uh, Uh-oh, I think Brother Luke is having another network issue. Yeah, we've, got two, we've got two loops again. How am I, how am I now? We're down to one loop again now. Okay, I don't know what's happening, but I'm back. Uh, uh, let me go on and reading here. It says, uh, Uh, is anything then Sarah denied saying I laughed not for she was afraid and he said nay but thou didst laugh and the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way and the Lord said shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do seeing that Abraham sh shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him and the Lord said because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous I will uh, go now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is to come, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou dis also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Wow. So, so now we're getting to this point where Abraham begins to negotiate with, with God. <laughs> I'll tell you that, that again, we're back to the heart again. Talk about what kind of heart that, that, that Abraham had towards God and God to Abraham. There was that connected that, that, that Abraham could haggle with God. Talk about relationship. You know, and and that's and that's what I think what Christ done with us. You know, brought us into a relationship where we can be reasonable. You know, people see God as unreasonable, don't they? You know, but but he even says to Isaiah, "Come now, let us reason together," saith the Lord. This is a reasonable, loving God, and, and I believe when when we connect to God through the heart, 
and God to us that, that, that we are in a position where we can talk to him as a loving father and we can have reasonable cordial debate with him. You know, God, you know, he isn't this rigid, unmovable... Tell you what, bro. Yeah, he's not this rigid, unmovable monster that, that religion he points him out as. You know, God himself created all things, was there in love, allowing Abraham, who's just a mere mortal, a creation, to haggle with him. You know, this is amazing. That This is one of the biggest mind-blowing, amazing relationships that, that you have, I believe, in the Bible, you know, out, you know, especially outside of the New Testament. It's amazing. And also, I think that the reason why he was able to do so is not just because he was he was walking with God, but also I think Abraham was a, a, one of the, actually the greatest salesman in the whole world, in, in the whole mankind. You know, he's wheeling and dealing right now, and no, no wonder he gathers so, so many, so much wealth. You know, throughout his life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that's funny. Uh, just like so, 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 just like those Arabian merchants, you know. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, let's uh, let's look at the rest of this uh, real quick here. The uh, how this plays out. Uh, uh, And the men, uh, Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure, there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the, the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Wow. Well, two things come to my mind. The word, the, the, the description wow. of the righteous, and then also that last thing where he's questioning God's. God, you know, are, are, are you going to do right or wrong? And that's, that's a lot of gall, I'd say. Well, I'll tell you what. This is a this this is a dogmatic free zone at the moment. Could you imagine a dog someone who's dogmatic saying you can't ever question God? You know, here's <laughs> Abraham, the father of the five, and he's haggling. He's quick. Surely you ain't gonna kill the innocent among the wicked. Come on, sort it out. And, and there's a real love and like relationship <laughs> between God and Abraham, and I, that's what. That's what the religious people don't get. That's what God flipping wants. He wants this relationship with us. And it's amazing. The, the important thing, I think the important thing to realize is that Abraham exactly knew the attributes of God. He exactly. God knew, I mean, Abraham knew God is love. Abraham knew uh, what God is, you know. So according to his logic, he's, 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 he's basically presuming there are some righteous in the soil. Now, that's why he's make, he's able to make this sort of argument, right? So that kind of tells me again that Abraham does know God and what God should be in a way. That's why you know Abraham is saying, "Hey, you know, if you if you destroy the righteous with the wicked, that means you're not God, basically. What what are you doing? You know?" So not only he was questioning. But also he would he he exactly knew the attributes of God. Mm -hmm. Well, I um, um, there's two things that stick out to me here. One is the question that he would even dare to negotiate and then even challenge God. Come on, God, aren't you a fair person? You know, it would be unfair to for you to kill the righteous too, wouldn't it? So. Uh, that is uh, amazing to me, but also the, just the word righteous, because you know later uh, other times in Scripture we see things like uh, no one is righteous, no not one, and if the righteousness of man is like filthy rags in the sight of God. So we understand that not one person is righteous, and yet Abraham is 
referencing, oh, there are some righteous people there. And God's not correcting them at this point and saying, no, there's nobody righteous. So how do you reconcile that? Well, I, I reconcile it in as much as the, uh, the only righteous people are, are people who believe on God. You know, that, this is why it's important to distinguish between, you know, when someone looks at someone's life and, and maybe they drink or they smoke or they, you know, they cuss every now and then, you know, the world will say that's unrighteous. But that unrighteous person is righteous in as much as he believes God. So, the, 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 although there is none righteous, no, not one, as in deeds, actions, and what they do throughout life, there are people who are righteous, and those are those who believe on God, and especially on Christ in the New Testament. So I think, you know, yeah, that, that that's important that, that, that we distinguish that. And I think, obviously, because God obviously knew that, that Lot and his family believed on him, because you look at Lot's lifestyle, Come on, you know, taking the best portion of Abraham, you know, living in Sodom itself, you know, having a good drink as we know he did, and then you know, you know, having some incestual affairs with his two daughters. Yet, as we know later on, Pete describes him as a righteous, just man. So, that in righteousness in himself was actually no chance, but righteous in the fact that he believed on this God of Abraham. Yes, he was righteous, and that is what you know. That, that's where the haggling was going on. For that sort of righteousness. And also, I think it shows the uh, the standard of man, how man considered other men to be righteous, and the standard of God, how God uh, make us righteous, uh, in a way. So, uh, you know, given the last verse. Uh, Abraham certainly thought that there are more than 10 people who are so-called righteous according to him. And, um, and that's why he, I guess, the conversation ended with just, you know, 10. You know, the deal just went out to 10. You know, had Abraham knew that there are none righteous, uh, unless God made you, of course, the uh, then he would say, like, hey, you know, uh, how about just one? <laughs> you know, if I were Amran, I would say, how about just one? You know, since uh, he's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm, what's, what's his name in Sodom? The, the guy, Lot, Lot. Lot, Lot right? yeah. I mean, Lot was, declared, Lot was declared to be righteous before God, right? Despite the fact that, you know, he had a little problem or despite the fact that uh, he is living in, in the Sodom, uh, you know, if we search the scripture, uh, just like jo uh, Job, Lot was also declared as righteous. So if I were like Abraham, and if I knew all this, then I, I would just kind of deal down from 10 to 1, you know. Maybe then Sodom would be saved. <laughs> but according to his uh, man, man's logic, Abraham probably thought there are at least 10 righteous in Sodom. Well, let's just say then, uh, without reading the rest of this this chapter, that uh, uh, Abraham um, continues on negotiating with God. He negotiates it down to ten people. If there are just ten righteous people, he won't destroy the city. And yet, we know that there weren't ten, so he didn't. He he did destroy the city. But uh, that leads us to a, a perfect segue to uh, the the righteousness of man and eternal life in heaven. And so, Brother Bill, you know, most people in the world today and throughout history uh, have believed in the merit system. Uh, if you ask someone, do you think you're going to go to heaven, and if so, why? Almost every person, apart from biblical Christians, almost every person is going to say, well, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven, or probably I'm going to heaven, or maybe I'm going to go to heaven, or I am going to go to heaven, but the reason is because I'm a good person. And they, they think they go to heaven because God ju judges them good enough. That's, what the, that's the whole religion of the world. All religions, and I'm not counting 
Christianity as a religion in that way because Christianity is not based upon going to heaven on personal merit. Christianity is based upon going to heaven because of faith in Christ. So, uh, Brother Bill, could you elaborate on that and tell anybody who's watching now, most people, unless they've already come to understand this gospel, they think that they get to go to heaven if they're good enough. What do you say about that, Brother Bill? Well, yeah, yeah. The Therefore, no flesh shall be justified in the sight of God, in that sense, to sum it up. And, and you're right that, that, that all religions, and that's every single religion on earth, and unfortunately, even some religious who claim the name of Christ, you know, believe that they can, you know, get to heaven on their own merit. And, and that is totally impossible. You know, it's not our righteousness that, that gets us to heaven, or any man, woman, or child to heaven. You know, it's only the imputed righteousness of Christ Jesus that, 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 that gets anyone heaven. You know, the, the word even says, you know, that, that even all our righteousnesses, and you, and you, you know, spoke this earlier, are as filthy brags of God. You know, God is, if there's the mark there for God, being 100% perfect, you know, even on our best day, our most obedient day, even if we fall short by that, we're not getting to heaven. We can never attain that perfect 100% righteousness that, that God demands, you know, and, and that is actually technical sin, because sin means to miss the mark. You know, we've only got to miss it by 1%, we're not getting in. You know, and to be honest with me, sometimes I'll be lucky if I even get 50%. But thanks be to God, I'm going to heaven according to what Christ has done for me and not what I can do. And this is the big difference that separates true Christianity the true living God and you know what what he has taught and what he has said and what he has done from every other religion on earth. Every other religion on earth is man trying to reach God's standard. Whereas Christianity is God himself coming down as a man and bringing this up through himself and in himself to God's standard. And that is basically that that, that God came to earth and that he made payment for all our shortcomings, our, our missing this mark, our sins. He made pain for every single one at Calvary. You know, and, and, and this is the wonderment. You know, where we couldn't make it, and as Brother Sam said earlier, you know, what is impossible for man or men is possible with God. So in our impossible state, and all the religions in the world in their impossible state, they cannot get to heaven. Heaven is only found through Jesus Christ, and only him alone. And he is the one that has made it possible. Not us making it possible, only him. You know, Jesus even declares, he says, you know, although what Jesus says is inclusive to every creature on earth, if they so choose, it is exclusive in that, that it is through him alone. And this is from Jesus himself. And he is God, remember. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come in the Father but by me. So there's no way to get into heaven except through Jesus Christ. None at all. You being good, you paying extra taxes, you tithing, you fasting, you going through religious, you know, rituals, you trying to be good to your neighbour, you know, you're doing all manner of things in your own effort. That's not good enough. Only Christ is good enough. It's only Christ that can get to heaven. And I'll, I'll say this and I'll say it every single week because it is the most, to me, one of the most fundamental few verses in the whole Bible where a direct question, you know, is given and a direct answer is given in response. And that is the example, you know, where Paul and Silas were in a jail and there was an earthquake. And this earthquake shook the jail and the jail doors sprang open, the chains fell off. And the, all these prisoners, they could have run off. You know, and under Roman law at time, at this time, the person who's in charge of, you know, looking over the prisons and the cells, if any prisoner escaped, he was sentenced to death. That's how harsh, you know, the Romans looked upon this sort of thing. But that happened. All their chains fell off, the doors swung open, and all these prisoners could have run, and this this per, this jailer, you know, would have been put to death. And in actual fact, what he was going to do, because he see this happening, he was just about to kill himself, all right? But Paul and Silas, obviously through the Holy Spirit speaking to him, through Christ speaking to him, you know, 
tell him not to. Don't kill yourself. Don't kill yourself. Don't do it. And then he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's the only time in scripture that a direct question is asked. You know, what must I do? You know, it's not what could I do or should I do. It is literally bare brass, you know, what must I do? And the, and Paul and Silas said, in accord, they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And that really is how simple it really is. You know, it's a tiny little bit of faith you need just to call upon Christ to be saved. You can't work your way to heaven. You can't earn heaven by your good deeds. We've worked that out. But you can get to heaven by believing on this Jesus Christ who loves you dearly this day. You know, he loves you so much that, you know, this is why he came to work. He came to work, you know, with one purpose, that he would die that you may live. That's it. He didn't come here just to give you good, you know, ideas on how to live, good moral standards. So have he done this? That wasn't his purpose. He died and gave himself for you that you can live and build him forever. And all you simply need to do this day to be saved, you know, from past, from, from death unto life, from, from, you know, unfortunately from hell, which is, you know, where, where people who will go who don't accept Christ the Saviour doesn't want you there but if you want to pass from that horrible place that he doesn't want you there to the paradise and being you know in eternal bliss with God all you need to do is believe on the Jesus Christ in the Bible the same Jesus Christ that died for every single one of your sins according to the scriptures the same Christ that was buried and pushed them sins into hell where they belong and the same Christ that was risen from the dead the third day according to the scriptures and that is vital that you believe those things because he did make pain for you, all your sins today. He was buried and he did rise victorious, having defeated sin and death itself. You know, And if Christ be risen, those who believe in him also shall be risen with him. And that means that you will live forever with all your sins paid for and you will be in paradise, a place where there's no more tears, a place where there's no more suffering, in a place that where there's abounding love forever. That has got to be the best news in the whole world. And I pray that, you know, even though Abraham, he erred at times, as you listen to this, you know, study tonight, you know, sometimes he, he, his faith wavered and, you know, he didn't believe in God entirely. But deep down in his heart, he, he was assured. You know, he had this relationship, which is vital between him and God. And if you want that same relation that as faithful Abraham had, not faithful by his own works and according to himself, but faithful in as much as he loved this God, who is the faithful one. If you want to be amongst Abraham and all the saints and all those who, who, who are off to a better place come this time ends, that you just simply believe on this Jesus Christ today. You know, just have that little tiny bit of faith, that, that the size of a mustard seed. You don't need a lot. You don't have to know all the information, all the facts in regard to God. All you just need to do is believe, yes, I believe in this God who was Jesus Christ. I believe he died for me. I believe he was buried. And I believe he rose again. And if I believe on them facts and in him, I will be with him forever in paradise. Just simply take that, that step of faith this day and come join us, brothers and sisters. You know, this is all we desire. You know, we don't get paid to do this. You know, we're not under some church affiliation where we get paid to get as many converts as possible. We're not a religion here. We're a relationship with a living God. And our desire is that you also can come into this living relationship with this living God this day. That I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, amen. Amen. Uh, all right. Uh, Brother, thank you for joining me today. And to all the viewers, uh, uh, I know that if you listen to Brother Bill's last remarks here, you understand that this gospel truly is good news. And I hope that you receive it with joy. And uh, if you do, if you do put your faith in Jesus today, please make a comment on the video and let us know. Uh, thank you all for watching. We'll, um, we'll be back again uh, next Sunday. Uh, I'll have to discuss whether we're going to continue on with 
Abraham or we want to go off on a tangent and discuss this concept of the angel of the Lord. But next Sunday at 1 p.m. and then each Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific time, uh, we will be going through uh, one chapter each each week uh, of, of the book of Proverbs. So if, if you desire wisdom in your life, join us on Wednesdays for more wisdom. Bless you all in the name of our great God and Savior. His name is Jesus Christ.